chairs for the spillover of the standing room only <laughs> event. Yay! Yay! Woo! I'd like to welcome you all tonight to the Writer's Voice Cafe. I'm Laura Shabbat, Chair of the Board of Library of Trustees. And tonight, I'd first like to start by asking you to turn off your cell phones you. because this is one exciting evening. <laughs> I want to acknowledge the hard, hard work that people do in our library to make events like this happen, Matt Clark and the staff, as well as the Writers Voice Cafe founders, Hilde Olson and Diane Hamilton. Tonight, to introduce Susan Rand Brown and Footprints in the Sand, uh, Berta Walker, we'll be introducing her, and she is the founder of Graham Modern Art in New York. And the reason that I asked her to introduce Susan tonight is because her grandparents, writer Harriet Avery and musician Harvey Gall, were here in that great summer of 1916. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Berta Walker. Snacks are over there for the break, and the coffee is decaf. <laughs> to talk to. I mean, really? all these <laughs> phenomenal writers. This is my writing. I'll try to keep it short. No, it's, a, it's really an honor to introduce Susan Rand Brown. I don't know why I'm really introducing Susan Rand Brown, but here I am, shaking. Um, Susan is, by professional terminology, a cultural critic and writer. To me, she's really a crystal. She's multifaceted. She's involved in all aspects of the culture in Provincetown. She shows up at every single play. She shows up at every single exhibition. <laughs> she shows up at every reading. And she's led by that enthusiasm and knowledge and wisdom. And, she, and I grew up with her. <laughs> so it turns out we became great friends through our addictions to <laughs> art. And um, that's why I get to say, you're in for a treat. I know she's been working on this for <coughs> a year and more. I will also say that last year, while involved in the Provincetown Playhouse Centennial Theater, pro the Players Centennial, I guess that's the right wording, um, we talked a lot about the history of the 1916 summer and the artists that were here. So she actually inspired me to do a show that is ne opening next week, which will include some 35 artists who were in residence creating art in 1916, oh, of which I have maybe four pieces created that year, the rest throughout, but you'll see 40, 80, 35 artists who were actually here 100 years ago, and that's fun. Where, so where is it? Uh, at the <laughs> Berta Walker Gallery. In Provincetown, <laughs> not right <here. laughs> And now, with no further ado, is a really special, special person, Susan Rand Brown. Years ago, in Hartford, not Provincetown, a friend of mine had a gallery show where he essentially cleaned out a lot of his room and put it in a little cubicle, and he called his part of this exhibition um, everything I have is in this room and when I look around of course it makes me realize that so many friends and it, people who have been enormous inspiration to me over the years in Provincetown are here right now and thank you very much it's it's an honor for me to be able to share this with you um, thank you for your time your energy and as they say, let's get on with the show. I'd like to dedicate today's presentation to my parents, Lily and Herbrand, who came to Provincetown with their young family in the 1950s because it was a ravishingly beautiful Bohemian community with a storied history. They studied with Provincetown painters, went to openings and partied with artists. For their family, still summering in their East End home, they too left footprints in the sand. <clears throat> the Portland Gale of 1888 was a natural disaster. 
Charles Hawthorne arrived to open his painting school 10 years later. By some eerie coincidence, you could say the tourist industry got started when the artists arrived, with the Portland Gale opening the door to scenic waterfront shacks suddenly available as low-cost artist rentals. Hawthorne, American portrait and genre painter and teacher, founded the Cape Cod School of Art in 1899. The son of a sea captain, he was born in Illinois, grew up in Maine. His most important teacher was William Merritt Chase, founder of the first summer plein air academy, Shinnecock Summer Art School on Long Island, based upon similar summer academies already popular in the United States and Europe. Hawthorne himself studied in the Netherlands and Italy. It was a zeitgeist, Hawthorne's arrival in Provincetown coincided with the founding of summer artist colonies in Old Lyme and Coscob, Connecticut, Rockport, Mass, and New Hope, Pennsylvania. The crew of the Philomena Manta is Charles Hawthorne's iconic statement, and O'Neill's seaplanes were to transmit a similar empathy for those who shipped out to sea, enduring the harsh life and risking the long voyage home. Hawthorne continued to teach in Provincetown until his death in 1930, drawing ambitious students like Oliver Chafee, Ross Moffat, and Edward Dickinson. The Dickinson is so beautiful. Fishing remained our major industry, a working port created an abundance of painterly genre scenes. By 1914, there were enough important artists on the scene to spark the formation of an art association, the cultural heart of the community, with Hawthorne a founding member, followed two years later by the Beachcombers Club, welcoming fishermen alongside visual artists and more. Both organizations, whose membership overlapped, continue to play vital roles in the evolution of our artist colony. Max Bohm came to town in 1916, also studied with Hawthorne, and chose to live permanently in our seaside town with its brilliant Mediterranean light and quaint, earthy flavor. Born in Ohio in 1868, he spent most of his professional life painting in Europe. He was <coughs> painter Anne Packard's grandfather. Blanche Lizelle also came to town to study with Hawthorne. Among the artists joining Lizelle in 1915 are Ada Gilmore, B.J. O. Norfelt, Edna Boise Hopkins, Agnes Weinrich, Ethel Mars, and Maud Squire. By the 1940s, still painting in Provincetown, Lizelle was much admired by major abstract painter and Hawthorne successor, Hans Hoffman. How's that for a creative wingspan? Here's Lizelle entering her studio, symbol and source of her floral paintings and woodblocks, and perhaps the structure whose destruction sounded the mostly unheeded alarm for historic preservation in Provincetown, especially of artist studios. To her friends, Lizelle wrote, up along and down along Commercial Street, a gaily colored throng constantly moved, the artists with paint boxes, the writers, musicians, actors, professors, New England natives, Portuguese women with shawls over their heads. Lizelle wasn't concerned about being labeled a regionalist or a genre painter. Rather, she opened herself up to the extraordinary in the ordinary. She also painted dinnerware and hooked wool rugs. Known for saturated colors, everything she did was a complex interpretation of nature. Lizelle and Hoffman, nature as blocks and curves of color, in love with the sensuous fruits of autumn in Provincetown. Wow. Lance Lizelle, Cape Cod in autumn, and Hans Hoffman, Miller Hill Road. Agnes Weinrich is worth her own chapter, <clears throat> not as a footnote as Carl Kanat's sister-in-law. 
It was she who introduced Kenneth to European modernism. Like Norfelt and Lazelle, Weinrich didn't back away from genre scenes either. Also a Hawthorne student, in 1915, she showed in the town's newly established art association, contributing nine pictures. Printmakers Maud Hunt Swire and Ethel Mars met at the Cincinnati Art Academy. From 1895, they devoted their professional careers to art and their lives to one another. They worked as book illustrators in New York, traveled to Europe to study old master paintings in museums, moved to Paris, and became part of the Gertrude Stein Circle. Squire and Mars were making and selling color woodblock prints from around 1910. Blanche Lazelle writes that Mars taught woodblock printing to Ada Gilmore and Mildred McMillan, and presumably to Lazelle herself. All would become esteemed as white line printers. By 1917, these white line printmakers were exhibiting at the Art Association with Ethel Mars, already a member of the selection committee. By 1925, Mars and Squires were living permanently in the south of France, part of the Arvis colony centered around Vence that included Matisse, Chagall, Renoir, Marston Hartley, Reginald Marsh, along with province towns Oliver Chafee and Ada Gilmore. The couple are buried in Vence, sharing a grave. <coughs> this, of course, is the iconic Lewis Wharf, the Wharf Theater, where O'Neill premiered Boundies for Cardiff. Its gripping storyline was worth the excitement of its first audience. What's still exciting about this particular image, see the detail on the right, is the glimpse of an artist also renting studio space from owner Mary Heaton Vorse. With the clarity of hindsight, we see this iconic image as a sign of year-round industry fading out, bowing to culture-based art tourism. But in this image, it's still 1915, and the artist colony that was to attract so many others was percolating. <coughs> Susan Glassbell, George Cram Cook, Neith Boyce, Hutchins Hapgood, all journalists and radical thinkers originally encouraged by Mary Heaton Voss to vacation in Provincetown and enthralled by our town's charms. They amused themselves with humorous and topical scripts before an audience of a few friends using the Hapgood's rented East End Cottage as their theater. Robert Edmund Jones, already prominent as an experimental theater designer, created their first sets. Word got around, almost immediately they needed bigger space and were offered the use of this rustic Vorse or Lewis Wharf. Their status as under the radar playwrights didn't last long. After the recognition accord of the Provincetown players, the astonishing life of Mary Heaton Vorse, or Mother Vorse as she was called, was forever linked to the mythology of theater history in Provincetown. This semi-centennial of her passing is the right time to view Mary Vorse in a grander, fuller context. As one of the most important forces behind the Provincetown Players crowd summering in Provincetown, Voss arrived from Manhattan in 1906, already an anti-war correspondent and pioneering labor journalist who fought hard for workers' rights. This image shows her with her second husband, Joe O'Brien, labor journalist, who died suddenly in 1915 the year Vors was a delegate to the International Women's Peace Conference. Vors wrote for Max Eastman's masses alongside Jack Reed. With Reed, she participated in the 1912 Lawrence, Massachusetts textile strikes. She was also a member of Heterodoxy, founded in 1912 a band of willful feminists with interests in birth control, suffrage, working women's rights, pacifism, socialism, and, it has been documented, lesbianism. <laughs> Mabel Dodge called heterodoxy, quote, a place for women who did things and did them openly. 
<laughs> American delegates in 1955, 1915 to the International Peace Conference in The Hague. Mary Heaton Vorse was there and also back in Provincetown for at least part of that celestial summer as she, Neith Boyce and Susan Glassbell, Hutchins Hapgoods and George Cram Cook, the nucleus of the Provincetown players, made their theatrical aspirations more than a summer affair. You'd call writers and political and progressives, Boyce and Hapgood, a power couple. They had been summering in Provincetown since 1911. Ensconced in their seaside rented cottage at 621 Commercial, on July 15th, this week, 1915, they treated their Greenwich Village ba band of buddies with constancy. Boyce's one-act comedy spoofing the off-again, on-again affair between Mabel Dodge and Jack Reed, the inconstant lover. This play had recently been rejected by the Washington Square players. It now seems likely that staging theatricals was more than a casual summer diversion for them. They wanted to found a little theater of their own, and so they did. Susan Glassbell and George Cram Cook's Suppressed Desires, also a comedy with Freudian analysis as lighthearted target, was likewise unveiled that night. Play fever was on, Hapgood wrote to Mabel Dodge. This Greenwich Village crowd arrived with much cultural sophistication. While we like to describe their influence in shaping the vocabulary of, a mod of modern American theater, another clue they were well aware of the theatrical renaissance going on in Lower Manhattan is found in Hutchins Hapgood study of New York's Jewish Quarter, S Spirit of the Ghetto, first published in 1902. Hapgood spent several chapters describing and praising the Yiddish theater, its actors and playwrights. Now that you're curious, the charmed circle of artists and writers gathered around Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas in 1922 Paris included Hutchins Hapgood and Neath Boyce, as well as Mabel Dodge, art patron, New York City salon hostess, and Jack Reed's lover before he met Louise Bryan. Already a recognized novelist and journalist when she and Cook arrived in Provincetown from Greenwich Village, Susan Glassbell's masterpiece, Trifles, written for the Provincetown group and first produced August 8, 1916, is the only play of the Provincetowners, except those by O'Neill, regularly read and produced. The white clabbered house she and Jig brought at 564 Commercial Street continues to be known as the Susan Glassbell House. In Trifles, two women solve a murder mystery set in a Midwestern farmhouse and keep what they know from the law, <laughs> a silently powerful rebellion against conventional gender roles. Glassbell was an early 20th century new woman her Greenwich Village and Provincetown crowd were also active in suffrage and other feminist movements. Glassbell's Allison's House, based on the life of Emily Dickinson, won the 1931 Pulitzer Prize for drama, at least for a while. O'Neill had submitted bounties to the Washington Square Players in the fall of 1915, which got rejected. Of the production in Provincetown, poet of the dunes, Harry Kemp, was to reminisce, we heard the actual speech of men who go to sea. That fall, it was to be O'Neill's first play produced in New York, also marking the Provincetown Players' auspicious debut on McDougal Street. Susan Glassbell, seated in the Wharf Theater on July 28, 1916, described the fishing shack open to the sea as Yank died and fog rolled in. The language found in family plays by Arthur Miller, Clifford Odets, Tennessee Williams, and Tony Kushner can be traced back to that confessional, halting speech, a gritty, poetic naturalism of the two sailors as they gradually reveal their pain, their dislocation, and their love, tangled in a web of compassion and humor, as depicted by a still untested playwright, now welcomed onto the stage in Provincetown. 
O'Neill's left of center politics, his empathy for the dispossessed, aligned him to the anti-war, anti-capitalist leanings of the Provincetown players. Consider the dialogue in the 1914 One Act Fog between poet and businessman, the anti-war sniper he wrote in 1915, as well as O'Neill's sea plays, whose subtext is the everyday seaman, workers trapped, bound in existential servitude. All the way to the broad humor of the tall tale, opening long day's journey, concerning the Irish peasant renting land from James O'Neill, who rails against Standard Oil. From the start, Eugene O'Neill's dramatic instincts stood out as political, as well as experimental, autobiographical, and laced always with poetic references to fog and sea. It was a great mistake, my being born a man. I would have been much more successful <laughs> as a seagull or a fish. Uh -huh. It was no accident that O'Neill's Greenwich Village friends included social activist Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, as well as Jack Reed. Like Reed, the young Bohemian Dorothy Day wrote for the left of center journals of her time. In 1917, she was arrested alongside Alice Paul for picketing on behalf of women's suffrage. Later in life, she credited Eugene O'Neill with, quote, having intensified the religious sense that was in me. And this precious image, what a smile. We can imagine Jean twinkling the ivories in a rendition of when Irish eyes were smiling. From the beginning, O'Neill embedded music as an important component in his plays. Even in the early sea play, Moon of the Caribbees, there's a lively Irish song and dance, a counterweight balancing the existential loneliness and futility he saw in the human condition. <clears throat> Jack Reed was another superstar in 1916 Provincetown. So was Max Eastman, editor of The Masses, which began publishing in 1912. Reed wrote for him from the start. Eventually, his lover and wife, Louise Bryant, also did. What draws and holds us together in Provincetown, writers, painters, even would-be revolutionaries like Reed, an open lesbian and gay community, came together in this bohemian outpost with its left bank sensibility, a revolving, often alcohol-fused, idea-saturated <laughs> salon, part Mabel Dodge, part Gertrude Stein, during that remarkable summer of 1916. With wartime preparations raging in Europe, Provincetown was primed for its red carpet moment. These rare photographs of Bryant and O'Neill together, and O'Neill with Reed, were first published last year in Robert Dowling's O'Neill biography, A Life in Four Acts. Apparently, the three were relaxed in each other's company, despite O'Neill's open and obvious affection for the attractive Brian. The love triangle, with Jack Nicholson playing the haunted, dark-eyed <laughs> poet, Diane Keaton as Bryant, and Warren Beatty as the irresistible Jack Reed, whose deathbed scene spares no tears, was dramatized in the 1981 film, Reds, loosely modeled on Reed and Bryant's experience as journalists right after the revolution. Bryant was to return home alone. Of the summer of 1916, Louise Bryant later wrote, no man, never before was so many in America who wrote or painted or acted ever thrown together in the same little place. This sense of floating eroticism is right here. Louise melding artfully into the dunes. In this photo sent, she sent to Reed that fall, filled with protestations of her love for him while slipping off to the dunes to continue her affair with O'Neill. <laughs> Reed and Bryant married that fall, but her, her affair with O'Neill was to continue even after the playwright met Agnes Bolton in 1917. Bolton and Jean married and lived in Provincetown together until the mid-1920s, first in the Johnny Francis apartments across from Glassbell and Cook, 
and then beginning in 1919 on the back shore. We'll get to that. The much-traveled Marston Hartley was in Provincetown for one summer only, 1916, later traveling to Bermuda with Charles DeMuth and Eugene O'Neill, his significant Provincetown compatriots. Through writing, paintings, and contacts with the modernist art community, a rose being a rose, his remarkable presence continues to stir the imagination. Hartley was close to his dealer, Alfred Stieglitz, they met in 1909, the year Hartley had his first solo show at Sleegit's New York City 291 Gallery. Hartley traveled to Paris in 1912 as a 35-year-old artist, met Gertrude Stein and her circle. In 1913, he traveled to Germany and met Kandinsky in Munich. He also met Karl von Freiburg, yes. subject and inspiration, for what many consider his most powerful paintings. It is with Germans that I have always found myself, both in New York and Paris, and now it is in Germany that I find my creative conditions, and it is there I must go, Hartley wrote to Sleekis in 1913, <clears throat> the year he painted military. Sleekis took this photograph of Hartley as a man about town in 1914 or 15. <laughs> The pioneer of modernism completed his German officer paintings the year before he arrived in Provincetown, having assimilated European Cubism, German Expressionism, Phobism. Kandinsky's influence also pours out in these muscular shapes, but it was for Hartley a joyful personal expression. The tasseled shoulder sash, the iron cross, these are memorials to Hartley's dead lover, called Ron Freiburg, killed in the first weeks of World War I. <laughs> Hartley's Arabian-inspired costume won a prize for <laughs> most artistic, by the way. His 1916 <laughs> chronology is full. His year begins with a visit to Mabel Dodge and Croton on Hudson. He exhibits oil paintings in Berlin and spends the summer what Hartley named the Great Provincetown Summer as John Reed's house guest at 592 Commercial Street. That summer found a lot of us at Provincetown, surely the biggest summer that most of us had lived through. Jack Reed, successful journalist and war correspondent, had taken a good-sized house for the summer and invited several of us to be his guests. Hartley rhapsodized in his memoir, Somehow a Pass. Of this image, Hartley in Arabian Kaftan, the artist and art historian Tony Vivers wrote in Provincetown Arts in 1991. The nomadic and constantly broke Hartley stood out in fronts, appearing as a prince. Hartley also began his movement series, often called the most subdued of his career. He himself confessed it was. At this time, he was weary of emotional excitement. While it's not certain this was painted in Provincetown or Bermuda, also a seafaring port, the subdued palette and flat imagery reads as an overlay of sails and hulls of boats. This one is especially interesting. Hartley's blend of the representation and the abstract creates this iconic image of Provincetown's urbanity, the monument flanked by sailboats, oversized cottages in the foreground. Charles DeMuth was another of Reed's 1916 house guests. When DeMuth died in 1935, Hartley published Farewell Charles, recounting their time together in Provincetown. Charles, like so many of us, became a part of a certain epoch of art history beginning with that remarkable and never repeated summer in Provincetown, where the Provincetowns, by that he meant the Provincetown players, began their first memorable attempt at a little theater movement, which was to produce one famous playwright, Eugene O'Neill. I love this photograph, and it is true. I wonder what they were talking about. It is said that Charles Marston, one of the brothers in O'Neill's prize-winning Strange Interlude, is a composite 
of DeMuth and Hartley. O'Neill's first masked drama, The Hairy Ape, was produced in 1921. This is likely Charles DeMuth's 1928 salute to his friend, Jean. Mm -hmm. When the Modern Art in America stamp series was issued, two of its 12 chosen artists were in Provincetown in 1916. Charles DeMuth, whose I saw the figure five in gold, is top row left, and the other was by Marston, hardly recognizable, of course, in the upper right from the German officer series. It's nice to see both of them officially honored as treasures of the history of American art. Margaret Zorak grew up in California in a family <coughs> where music and art were encouraged. In Paris, she attended the post-impressionist school La Palette, where she met William Zorak and associated with Pablo Picasso and Gertrude Stein, and did many of her Provincetown group. The Zoraks both exhibited in 1913's groundbreaking Armory Show, spent the winter of 1915-1916 in Greenwich Village, and arrived in Provincetown the summer of 1916, becoming involved with the Provincetown group, acting and designing sets. Marguerite's Egyptian-inspired set design for Louise Bryant's The Game, with Bryant, Reed, and William Zorak in the cast, was widely admired for this abstract pattern of the moon leading into the water. As a painter, Margaret Zorak's star continues to rise. The exhibition O'Keefe, Stettheimer, Tor, and Zorak, Women Modernists in New York, which included her Fauvist-inspired painting, The Bathers, which we just saw, opened in, in 2015, this past fall, at the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach, and is now touring the country. I'm going to move on to the second part of the presentation and what was to become of our dramatis personae after that great summer of 1916. The first floor front parlor of this 1840 brownstone row house was the first New York City home for the Provincetown players, becoming a Manhattan-based little theater after all receding the magical aura of the Provincetown name. During the six-year life of the Provincetown players, they produced 97 original plays by 46 American playwrights. Time would remember the Provincetown players as the first modern American theater company. When the players moved to New York, they opened their new venture with Louise Bryant's The Game, Marguerite's set design, translated into this William Zorak woodcut was a key image placed outside the theater itself. Its abstract design signals their commitment to modernism in art as well as in theater, and their break from realism and melodrama, or what O'Neill liked to call the Broadway show shop. <laughs> so Short a Time is the title of biographer Barbara Gelb's book on the intertwined lives of John Reed and Louise Bryant. After the halcyon summer of 1916, the pair married and spent the rest of their limited days together and apart, traveling to war zones mm -hmm. and experiencing and writing about the Russian Revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sent by an American news syndicate to cover the revolution from the woman's point of view, <laughs> Bryant wrote Six Red Months in Russia. Reed's account of the revolution, 10 Days That Shook the World, became a classic. He died of typhus in October 1920, Louise by his side, and was buried at the Kremlin Wall. Louise lived for another 16 years, her life a downward spiral, in 1936 finally collapsing in her Paris hotel room of a cerebral hemorrhage. She was only 48 years old. Glassbell and Cook went to Greece in 1924, upset over the professional direction the Provincetown Players Theater was taking. His theater, Cook always believed. The Players closed in 1922, reopening a year later as a professional 
theater company, and remember Cook always wanted an amateur theater company, producing world rather than only American drama. Cook died in Greece and was buried in Delphi. Glassbell returned to Provincetown alone, bought a second home in Truro to escape Provincetown's summer crowds, <laughs> moved for the seasons from P-Town to her Truro farm, married a much younger man who broke her heart, remained close to the Hapgood family and to Mary Heaton Voss. In the 1930s, she went to work for the Federal Theater Project, reading and producing plays. Ironically, when the government shut down the Federal Theater, it cited Glassbell and Cook's suppressed desires as an example of salacious material being foisted <laughs> on the public. <laughs> Glassbell continued to write and publish, was a charter member of the Provincetown Civic Association, protesting the cutting down of local trees, there you go. <laughs> giving awards to local school children. And she died in July of 1948 at the age of 72, attended by Dr. Daniel Hebert, one of O'Neill's earliest friends. Her ashes are scattered behind her home in Truro, and a marble memorial stone was placed in the Snow Cemetery. Despite Glassbell's long and rich literary life, her 12 plus plays, short story collections, nine novels, she still remains best remembered for her 1916 discovery of Eugene O'Neill. Forum 47 was a landmark in asserting the town's modern art, largely abstract expressionist scene after World War I. With Hoffman the reigning master, other exhibiting artists included Motherwell, Adolf Gottlieb, Carl Knaff, Jackson Pollock, and a separate exhibition featured four Provincetown artists then recognized as pioneers of modern art. Ambrose Webster, Oliver Chafee, Agnes Weinrich, Blant Lazelle. This photo shows Lazelle, her paisley dress and sensible shoes, sitting apart, the last of her generation, continuing to exhibit new paintings and prints. She worked in her Provincetown studio until she was hospitalized on the Cape in Bourne, where she died on June 1st, 1956, mm -hmm. 60 years ago. Wow. Here's the Pecan Hill Bar's life-saving station, purchased by actor James O'Neill from Mabel Dodge, as a wedding present for the playwright and his wife, writer and memoirist Agnes Bolton. They moved to this isolated home on the back shore in 1919. Bolton's excellent autobiography, part of a long story, a gossipy intimate saga of O'Neill, his circle of passionately creative, self-destructive friends, an equally dysfunctional family as she witnessed them, is still relied upon by O'Neill's biographers. Agnes and Jean lived there from 1919 to 1924 with children Shane and Una, also living in a small cottage behind Susan Glassbell's house. The life-saving station was the setting for Susan O'Neill's play, The Outside, performed in Provincetown for the first time last summer and directed by Stuart Derrick, who's here tonight. Pecan Hill, as seen from the inside, after one-time owner Mabel Dodge transformed it to echo a southwestern <laughs> adobe <Yeah>. homestead. <clears throat> the play that O'Neill won his first Pulitzer Prize for, Beyond the Horizon, about two Irish brothers in love with the same woman. Could the playwright have had in mind Louise Bryan <laughs> and her greater love, Jack Reed? Of course, the play's irony is the brother who won the woman and stayed on the farm also gave up his career, much as O'Neill felt his father had done as a vaudeville actor. O'Neill's source material is always multi-layered. Mm. While Beyond the Horizon, his first play to appear on Broadway, is forgettable, O'Neill's stature continued to grow after the Pulitzer. He left the Provincetown players for Broadway, O'Neill's experimental, even daring plays of the 1920s and beyond, continued to take aim at theatrical realism, 
returning to a poetic naturalism during his final decade. Where would American drama be without The Iceman Cometh and the breathtakingly autobiographical Long Day's Journey in Tanae? Mm. And I'm one of these people that always says, it's not too long, it's barely <laughs> long enough. <laughs> he and Agnes Bolton divorced in July of 1929. By then, O'Neill's love affair with Carlotta Monterey was widely known. They had met on the set of O'Neill's The Hairy Ape in 1922. After several stormy years, his personal life in disarray, disarray he and Monterey, Monterey escaped to Tours outside Paris, was shortly married, and leased a 35-room stone chateau in Paris, Danville, California, and elsewhere. Carlotta kept him sober, kept his friends away, and allowed him to write his final autobiographical masterworks. O'Neill was to turn his back on Una when she married the 54-year-old Charlie Chaplin. But their marriage lasted 35 years and produced eight children. Shane took his own life in 1977. O'Neill, who was born on October 16, 1888, in a Broadway hotel room in Times Square as what was the Barrett Hotel, now a Starbucks at the corner of 43rd Street <laughs> and Broadway. He died in Boston on November 27, 1953, at the age of 65, of bronchial pneumonia in what was then a Sheridan Hotel. He's known to have whispered, I knew it, born in a hotel room, died in a hotel room. <laughs> Said the Provincetown advocate on December 3rd, 1953, many in Provincetown are recalling memories of a quiet, almost taciturn young man who came here back in 1916 and whose early plays produced in an old fish shed along the shore, won him fame that took him to the top of the drama world and left an afterglow which continues to stimulate thousands of visitors even today. Of that first bound deep for Cardiff reading, when O'Neill died, poet of the dunes Harry Kemp recalled how the silence fell on the small 1916 audience during which O'Neill writhed in torment of what he felt was just going to be another abysmal failure. Then George Cram Cook, sensing the history-making play, told O'Neill that their theater was to be his theater. Decades later, Tennessee Williams was to say, O'Neill gave birth to the American theater and died for it, referring to what the Parkinson Riddle playwright suffered to handwrite his final plays. So significant was Mary Heaton Voss that a sizable FBI file on her travels and passionate pro-worker and pro-peace writings was maintained until she was in her 80s. <laughs> she participated in the steel strike of 1919, traveled to Lenin's Moscow, and at age 88, she was given the first United Auto Workers Social Justice Award, with Eleanor Roosevelt and Upton Sinclair there to witness that honor. In the 1970s, and with Provincetown neighbors, Force was marching against the Vietnam War. She died at, night, at age 92 in Provincetown on June 14, 1966, and is buried in the town cemetery. Your speaker remembers Vorce being lifted by neighbors from wooden steps onto the sand at the Cook Street Beach so she could swim across the street from her, from, from her historic East End home. The Kibbe Cook House, Vorce always called it, formerly owned by the last whaling captain to sail out of Provincetown, Cook had declared bankruptcy when the market collapsed. Here's how it looks today. It would make a wonderful small museum telling the story of Provincetown's many freedom fighters. It's a great idea. It is Mary Heaton Vorse who wrote in Time in the Town, Provincetown is like an onion, layer on layer, whirl on whirl, or to exit the stage with words from Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey in Tonight, reframed for our centennial year, and Provincetown's continued status 
as a nurturing home and source of artistic inspiration. The past is the present, and it's the future, too. Wow. a whole hour and I know that we're all grateful for that. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for your rapt attention. I really do appreciate it. This was very special for me and I hope it was for you as well. Thank you. Wasn't that fabulous? Yes. Uh, great. Is there any questions at all that any of you have for Susan? Or contributions. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> any questions? Okay, any comments, questions? Yes, Jane. I'd like to say one thing about a tree that Susan Glassbell, you talked about her saving trees. Yes. And you know she saved one that was on her own street, and it is now in front, it's huge, in front of Town Hall, tiny little plaques that Susan Glassbell. Thank you for reminding of that. I believe it's, it's an ash tree. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Dear Susan, could you right, please Chris. combine some of the... Can't hear you. Could you please combine How many people say? the theatrical, the writing, and the artistic confluence of the people you are speaking about? Okay, so Chris's question Next is, summer. can you combine <laughs> the, the, the theater, <laughs> art... Next summer. And Writing. literature. Next summer's your answer? Yes, sir. And actually also add dance, because uh, no, this was later dance. in the oh. 50s. There was a pretty strong dance community here. Thank you. I had no idea. Thank yeah. you very much yeah. for suggesting that. There's still kind of something I want. Well, this was absolutely fantastic, wasn't it? Thank you. All right. Yeah.